Good afternoon. My name is Alice Murray, and I'm one of the pastoral interns here, and I am honored to be able to lead us in our midweek Lent service this week. We want to thank, uh, thank one of our men's faith life groups who provided a great lunch for us. Make sure you join us next week at 1130 for some time for fellowship and lunch before we join in here uh, for service. So I invite you now to stand as we join our voices in our opening hymn. We begin worship this afternoon in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to please join me as we take time to confess our sins in silence, reflecting on how we have sinned against God and one another. Now, please join me as we pray together, acknowledging our sin and turning to God for forgiveness. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. 
Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer? Stir up our hearts, O oh Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you now to be seated. Just like John invited you to sit last week for his scripture, mine's not quite as long, but we've been standing for a while. So I'm just going to invite you now in this space, in this time, to just rest in Jesus and these words that we're going to hear from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. Jesus then began speaking to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He still sent another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had only one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyards do? He will come and kill the tenants and give the vineyards to the others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone of the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Uh, some powerful words coming from this parable uh, this afternoon. So before we really dig into this, will you join me in prayer? God, we just thank you that you are a God that constantly reaches out to us and loves us and wants us to learn and grow in our faith. And so this afternoon as we dig into this parable of the tenants, God, I just boldly ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to what we might take from this parable, especially during this season of Lent, and how we can take this out with us and connect it to our faith and life and continue to grow, Lord. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would be here and talk through me, Lord, the words that you want us to hear today. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. So we are talking about this, the parable of the tenants. In some uh, translations, it says the uh, parable of the wicked tenants. And so I want to give you a little context for this verse before we study it a little bit this afternoon. This comes right after the authority of Jesus was questioned. So just a few verses before this in, the, in Mark chapter 11, 20 through 7, 28, it says, They arrived in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you authority to do this? So Jesus is really kind of just on the hot seat right here, right? And it's also the last parable we hear Jesus speak. So there's a lot of meaning to this. And we need to remember that he's addressing the Pharisees at this moment. That's who he's telling this parable, this story to, those who are rejecting him. That's one of the main points of this passage is that God's son will be rejected only to be vindicated and that those who rejected him will be judged. 
Now, I know, uh, probably like a lot of you, we know what rejection feels like. It's probably one of the most painful things we have to face in our life. Uh, we've experienced the pain, the embarrassment, the humiliation, being cast out or abandoned or turned down and overlooked. And this is where we find Jesus at this moment. Jesus is being rejected. So let's take a look at this parable and what we can take from it. First of all, let's figure out who is who in this parable. First is the tenants. Now these are the religious authorities at the time, the Pharisees, the one who wants all the laws followed, and they see Jesus as a lawbreaker who needs to be held accountable. And then we have the servants. These are like the prophets. Many prophets had come before Jesus to share what God wanted for his people, and they were also rejected over and over again by the Pharisees because they were only worried about keeping the law. And then we have the son who he loved. This is Jesus. Jesus was God's beloved son who was sent to share the good news, and he was rejected and killed like the slaves in this parable. And then we can't forget who the owner of the vineyard is in this parable, and that would be God. So we can look at this parable in a much deeper way. The way Jesus intended for the parables to speak to the Pharisees who were rejecting him at this time. The ones who wanted him to get out. The ones that wanted to make sure he wasn't listened to. But this parable is also being told for the others. The others who saw Jesus, who trusted in him, and were being obedient to him. So to review here, Jesus is saying that God, the landowner, leased this property to the tenant farmers, which we could think of as the Jewish leadership. But when he sent his servants, the prophets, to collect fruit from the vineyard or the land of Israel, they were mistreated and killed. So he went for more servants, but they received the same treatment. And finally, the landowner sends his son Jesus, because surely they will respect him. But the tenants get rid of him in hopes of gaining the vineyard for themselves. At this point, the landowner intervenes decisively. He says he will destroy the wicked tenants and give the vineyard to other people. So let's spend the next few minutes digging into this and what we can learn from it. So I want to reread a little bit of this scripture. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builder rejected became the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Right? The tenants were wanting to make sure their own wants and needs were being met, not what God's plan was. They thought their plan was better than anything God could have given them. They wanted the law followed and for Jesus to be held accountable for the things he was doing and for their opinion of what they thought he was breaking the laws. And the servants here, they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were being obedient to God's plan. They were following the call that he'd put on them. So we have this context now of where everybody's at, but where's Jesus in this? Well, Jesus is giving a strong warning to the religious leaders that God sees and hears this rejection, that judgment is coming. And in this parable, Jesus is also predicting his own death that's going to happen to him because of what God's response will be in this whole scenario. Those who reject the word of God and the Son of God will receive the judgment of God. Verses 9 through 12 tell us that God will reject the tenants, the leaders of Israel, just as they have rejected his son. Jesus answers his own question in verse 9. He says that the owner of the vineyard will destroy those who killed his son and give his vineyard to others. God will reject those who rejected his son. He will judge those who judged his son. Notice here, though, that he's not, the vineyard's not going to be judged, but the tenants are going to be judged. The nation of Israel is not totally rejected by God. The corrupt leaders of that land will be. God still has a beautiful plan for Israel. But Jesus also says that the vineyard will be given to others. The others who will get this vineyard are the Gentiles. God's new people will be made up of Jews and Gentiles, and this new people will be called the church. It'll become the new and true Israel. 
The church will be made up of people from many different places and lots of different backgrounds, just as God wanted it. In verses 10 and 11, Jesus suggests that religious leaders should have known what was coming. It said, have you not read the scripture? Then he quotes Psalm 118, 22 through 23. He quotes the verses where God says that the cornerstone would be rejected and then vindicated and that his rejection was according to plan. Friends, Jesus is the cornerstone that will support and hold together this new building that God is constructing. The despised and neglected stone that was cast aside by the builders will become the stones or building blocks for a whole new temple that God is building through Jesus. And the temple is called the church. It's where God's spirit dwells and where all the nations of the world are drawn together by the love that God has revealed in the death of his son, Jesus. Jesus' death is the foundation of the church, the new and everlasting people of God. Verse 11 says that Jesus' humiliation and rejection was planned by God for a greater purpose, that it would be marvelous in our eyes. The rejection and death of God's beloved son was according to plan. So what about these others that we hear about? It says in verse 9, What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to the others. The others are those who see Jesus and his gift of grace. The others see Jesus as the cornerstone, the foundation of strength that Jesus gives us when we follow him. The others are the church. The others are us. God calls us to hold true to this cornerstone, to hold that Jesus has a plan for us and to respond in obedience to see the kingdom of God already being established, not just in this parable, but here and now, in this church, in this place, in this community. So let's go back for a moment to what the landowner does here. He sends multiple people to receive the fruits of the harvest from the vineyard. Each one meets a worse fate, from being beaten to killed, and then finally he sends his beloved son. It makes me think what landowner in their right mind would keep sending people there? What landowner in their right mind would send their own child to people like this? What kind of father would send his son to people who despise his authority and mistreat his servants, to people who have killed every single other person that he has sent? God is that kind of father. God would send his son. The simple act of God sending his son shows us how much he loves his people, even people who don't love him back. God loves us so much that he sent us his son. God is holy, yet we've rejected him. We thus deserve his judgment, but in his abundance of mercy and his overflowing gift of grace that he sends to us, he sent Jesus instead of judgment on us. The sending of the Son of God reveals the love that God has for us. We can remember this when we doubt whether God loves us. He does. It's a fact. He sent his Son, Jesus, to show us that. The Son comes with the Father's authority. This is why the owner says, they surely will respect my Son. But Jesus was sent like the other prophets were sent. But he's so fundamentally different than these prophets. He's God's own Son. He has this unprecedented role on his shoulders in Israel's history and in God's plan of redemption. To say that Jesus merely is a prophet and a good teacher fails to encompass all of what Jesus says about himself in this parable and how we see Jesus and what he's done and continues to do in our lives. The son was treated just like the rest of the servants. Jesus is saying that Israel killed and mistreated everyone God sent to them. Israel didn't want to hear from God, so they tried to silence his spokespersons. So my question for us today is, what will you do with God's gift of grace in your life? Jesus said this this powerful parable of the tenants, that he was the cornerstone, that he was who we should believe in. And he is so important that he's repeating this over and over to us so that we truly grasp what this is saying. He is the cornerstone for those who believe, 
but yet he can also be a stumbling block and a rock of offense if we don't. So in other words, we can't be neutral about Jesus here. We're either for him and richly blessed by him, or we're against him and severely crushed, depending on what our response is to his gift of grace and love in our lives. Friends, don't underestimate who you are and what you are in Christ. You're not a dirty rock. You're one of the millions of living stones holding up this house of God, created by the word of God and built on the Son of God as our cornerstone. Our local church and global church is more precious and powerful than we even realize. It's where God chooses to live. It's where we find spiritual life. It's the community that God wants us to be in and walk through to share the gospel. It's where we connect our faith and our life. So how can we focus on this parable this Lent season? So much of Lent is about renewing our beliefs in Jesus, about refreshing our soul, about resting and abiding in him, and about reflecting in what he's done for us. So my challenge for us is to remember that he is the cornerstone of our faith. He is the foundation that we build upon, and as a church and a community, we get to come together to lay the rocks and the foundation to grow in our own faith, to help people know Jesus, and to bring them along with us. Will you pray with me? God, we just thank you that you are a God who sent your son to be the cornerstone, that you promised to be with us and not against us. You invite us into this beautiful relationship, Lord, where we get to rest in you and all that you've given and done for us. Help us to trust in that. Help us to remember the plentiful things that you give us and the overwhelming blessing of grace and mercy you give us. Help us not keep it to ourselves. Help us to give it to others. And during this season of Lent, where we spend some more time hopefully digging into your word and resting in you, help us to be refreshed by this parable, this truth that the others that saw Jesus were blessed and protected and given great mercy and love. And we're invited into that every day as Christ followers. During this season, Lord, continue to grow us, continue to stretch us, and help us rest in the foundation you have given us. Help us to be your church. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
you please join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you that you are our cornerstone. You are the rock and firm foundation of our faith. You desire for us to rest in this strength, to walk in obedience to your call in our lives, and to love others like you love us. Help in in this season of Lent to reflect on your gift of grace to us, to renew our relationship with you and those you call us to disciple and share our faith with. We pray today for a world that needs to hear and experience this gift of mercy and grace that you so freely give to those who accept and follow you. We pray for those who are hurting, sick, suffering, and lonely. I especially today lift up to you Jim, Pat, Kim, and all those who are suffering from cancer and other illnesses or diseases that attack their bodies. Help them find comfort and peace in you, Lord. We pray for the chaos of our world that your peace might reign. God, we thank you for the love you have for us. Lord, help us continue to grow our faith and walk with you in our homes, work, neighborhood, and communities. We join our voices now in the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now hear the benediction of our Lord. As you go on your way, may God go with you. May God go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we've joined together already in our closing hymn, so I have one last thing to say to you this morning, or this afternoon. Go in peace and serve the Lord.